And our hymn for the day is Speak, O Lord, your servant listens. St. Mark, the seventh chapter, Jesus called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand, there is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of the person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable, and he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart but his stomach and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him, for from within, out of the heart of man, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, evil, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. 
peace and mercy from God our Father and from our Lord who is the Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Please be seated. I want to turn your attention to our Old Testament lesson today, the book of Deuteronomy. The word Deuteronomy means second law. And the book of Deuteronomy really is sort of Moses' final address to the people. A work which was probably done in the last two months of his life. And he's getting up there in years. He's about 120 years old. His eyesight is still keen. His hearing is still good. He's still addressing the people. And he recalls for them the work that God had done in the past. You see, most of the people he's talking to were born in the wilderness. They weren't there when God parted the Red Sea. They don't know personally about the brutal times and hostility that the people of God suffered while in captivity in Egypt. And being born in the wilderness, not traveling through it, they probably don't recall the hardships, the pain and torment and dangers they faced in the wilderness. So he recounts God's achievements for them because he's encouraging them now to go into the land that God has promised, not to them, but to their fathers and forefathers. And he's encouraging them because he's not gonna go with them. In Deuteronomy 1.1 it says, these are the words which Moses spoke to all of Israel across the Jordan while in the wilderness. Just before chapter four, God is speaking to Moses. He takes him up onto Mount Fisgah There he could oversee and see the promised land, but he says, you're not going in. And I want you to commission Joshua to lead my people into the promised land. Encourage him and strengthen them that they might be ready. And so Moses has some very important words to speak to the children of Israel. And our text starts with these words. Now, O Israel, listen. In Hebrew, it's actually Viach a Israel Shema. Or in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it is actually a little bit different. The words are Kai Nun Israel Akuo. The words Shema and Okuo are words that mean to listen, to understand, to comprehend. It is something that is being said that you need to take to heart. It's a core belief. It's an important thing. And God uses that word often. Matter of fact, Jesus uses it. In in Mark 7, 14, in today's gospel, he says, Hear me, all of you, and understand. Hear me, akuo me. It's that word from which we get the word acoustic. But it's more than just listening. It's hearing. It's comprehending. It's being able to echo back the thought. When I was in high school, so many years ago, I had a teacher who taught history and he loved to give essay exams every week. Four or five essay questions on each exam. And during class, he used to say, now listen, and you better listen because right after that, he would give you all the information you needed to answer the essay exams correctly and to get a passing mark. I wish I had figured that out before halfway through the semester. But I still ended up getting an A. It was a lot easier after knowing that. Listening has two parts. The first part is listening, paying attention. Hearing is comprehending and understanding and taking it to heart. 
Now, you may have experienced this. You could be talking to a person and they may be nodding their head and smiling. And you're thinking, wow, they're a great listener. But if you look at their eyes, you'll see them kind of staring off in the distance. There's someplace else in their head, off on a trip in La La Land, maybe. And let me tell you, there's a good example of that probably in all of our lives. How many times have you watched a TV program or know someone that has? And afterwards, they can't even tell you a thing about it. And if you don't believe that, then you ought to be a pastor with confirmation kids and ask them what the sermon last week was about. Unfortunately, we tape them now and they can hear them. They get away with it. The second part of listening is really the Shema or Akuo part. And that word Akuo is used in the New Testament and it means catechesis. That's what we do in confirmation classes. For instance, give you an example. The first commandment, you shall have no other gods. What does this mean? That's the akuo part. That's the echo part. It means what? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. That's the akuo. That's the acoustics. That's the echo. That's the catechesis. In our Old Testament lesson today, Moses does that sort of teaching in the Shema, the, the teaching. And what is he teaching? Now listen. Now Shema. Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the just decrees that I am teaching you, and do them, that you may live and go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you. You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. So we are forbidden to add or take from the word of God, which was spoken through Moses. And when we get to the book of Revelation, we again hear that prohibition in adding or taking away from the word of God as spoken through John. Now, I find it interesting that people like to mess around with the Word of God by adding to it or taking away from it. But you see, that's something we are forbidden to do, to add to it or diminish that which God has declared. And we see why in Isaiah 55, 11, my word shall go forth from my mouth and it shall not return to me void without accomplishing that for which I have sent it for that which I have desired. To take away from the Word of God or to add to the Word of God is to diminish what God is trying to accomplish. And it still happens today. It happens when we hear phrases like, well, what God means in that passage is, and people lean to their own understanding and put in their own words, think of a phrase that might fit after that. Scripture then becomes a matter of personal interpretation. Obey what you want, forget about the rest. Change the meaning if it will work better with you. And you start hearing phrases then like this, directly quoted, by the way. Scripture is the inspired and true word of God as far as it is revealed to you. Or as far as it is correctly translated, another group says. But according to who? It's another way of saying, well, I get to put in my two cents worth. I get to interpret what God's word says. Now, I've shared this before. So if it sounds familiar, you know why. When I was growing up, I found a refrigerator magnet in a Bible store, Christian bookstore. And on that refrigerator magnet, it says, God says it, I believe it, that settles it. Well, I fell in love with that thing. I had to buy it. And I immediately put it on the dash of my dad's car. Back then, they had metal dashes. 
And for years I lived by those words. I believed those words. They seemed good, right, and salutary. They seemed noble. They seemed worthy of repeating. But they were wrong. I learned later it should have said, God says it. That settles it. It doesn't need my approval. There are certain scriptures that are really hard to swallow, yes, even for me, but they're still God's word and it's still the truth, whether I agree with it or not. And it goes out and accomplishes that for which it was set, not my words. We are reminded in 2 Timothy of this. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. 2 Timothy 3.16. Now listen. For Moses goes on to say some profound words. Behold, I have taught you the statutes of the judgments the Lord commanded me. Now keep them and do them, for this is your wisdom and understanding. For what nation is there that is so great? Who had the that God had been so near to them as the Lord our God is in all the things which we call upon him for. For what nation is there so great that has the statutes and judgments that are so righteous as all of his law, which I set before you this day? Only take heed to yourselves and keep thy soul diligently, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life but teach them to your sons and to your sons' sons. Teach them to your children and to your children's children, to your grandchildren. Teach these commandments, these statutes. There's no nation in all the earth that had that privilege of having God so close as the children of God, to be near to them and to give to them and to provide for them his righteous law. And then he goes on to speak about how the law came on Mount Horeb or, or Mount Sinai Horeb and how the people were afraid and frightened because of the thunder and the lightning. You see, God's ways are not our ways. God's word is not our word. It's his word. I've already shared about the Shema and the Akuo how God wants us to hear his word, but he also wants us to hear it and to gladly learn it. Or as we pray so often at the end of the service, and maybe next time you'll really pay attention to this, blessed Lord, you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them that by patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and never hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. God's word keeps us from falling prey to the predators of this fallen world. Keeping God's word pure and undefiled, though, is a daunting task. And that's why one of the solas of the solas of the Reformation is sola scriptura, Scripture alone interprets Scripture. Or as Proverbs 3 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. We come to God's Word not to try to structure it, but to have us structured and built up by it the way He wants us to be. What does God want you to be? What does God want you to do? Probably more than you could ever imagine. You see, our minds are finite. We are finite, but God is infinite. We limit our thinking, but he does not. God is infinite. His mind is infinite. His ways are beyond our ways. He wants so much more for us than we could ever think or ask. So ask away. That's why St. Paul says in our reading today, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the schemes of the devil. 
For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And then he goes on to say, use the sword of the Spirit, that is the very word of God. The word we need to know. The word we need to learn. You see, all of it's about communication. God communicating to us and us communicating with each other and us communicating to God. His word for us. And you see, God uses men to accomplish that. But then so does the devil. That's why Jesus says, what comes out of a person is what defiles him. For within, out of the heart of man comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. So what's inside of you? What do you eat with your eyes and your ears and your experiences every day and every hour of your life? Do you gorge yourself on the rhetoric of the world and its message of immorality and tolerance? Or do you fill yourself with the very word of God and of his kingdom and of faith and of hope and of joy? Do you seek first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness? Do you set your mind upon things that are worthy of praise? James Dobson, a family focus, talked of the importance of communication with each other and especially with our children. He talked of the importance of making eye contact while communicating with our children to make sure that they're not just listening but hearing. And so he said it's very important when you talk to somebody, especially children, you make eye contact with them. You can tell in a person's eyes whether they're talking to you and what they're saying. He shares his experience that a pastor had been at the conference learning about this interpersonal communication skills and came to him the following week. And he said, Dr. Dobson, I've I just can't do it, it's so hard. And Dobson looked at him and said, what seems to be the problem, Pastor? He's my son. He's a typical PK. Preacher's kid. And I asked him to clean his room and he didn't. And I asked him to clean his room and he didn't. So I remembered what you said to make eye contact. So I decided to try it. And so I walked over to my son, I grabbed him by the collar, picked him up to my face, and said, go clean your room! My son started crying, but he cleaned his room. He goes, I don't know if I can do this again. And Dobson looked at him and said, whoa, wait a minute. I didn't mean pull somebody up to your face. You get down to their level and look at them eye to eye. Humble yourself, showing them how important it is that they listen. The pastor said, well, I could do that. That's why God uses men to speak his word. Uses people like us to share his word with us. And it goes beyond that, for we are in a spiritual battle he sends his son to become one of us, lowering himself down to our level. And in this spiritual battle, we have a victor, the gallant one, gallant one. Gallion's a ship, a little different. The gallant one who has come to fight the fight and he has won. He lived a life we could not he died a death we dare not to give us what we deserve not, eternal life. And he comes to communicate with you again today to speak God's love to you from his cross, to tell you that for those sins I have died. And he reaches out in that love 
And he says, now listen. All your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You see, you have my word on it. In Jesus' holy name, amen and amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord.